Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s is finally here, and it is completely different from all of its previous shows. From its art style and mechanics to its tones and themes, 7 is already so unique to the franchise that many existing fans don't know how to react to it. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I'd say if you've ever thought about getting into Yu-Gi-Oh! but were scared of jumping onto this complicated roller coaster ride of a franchise, now is probably a good time to try. Although 7s is very different and you definitely shouldn't go into it thinking the other shows are very similar, its goal is being as open as possible to new audiences for both the show and the card game. It's been 20 years since Duel Monsters first aired and Yu-Gi-Oh! exploded into a massive franchise. Over that time, several iterations of the anime have come and gone, and they're all made primarily with the purpose of selling the actual card game. Despite that, Yu-Gi-Oh! still managed to entertain its viewers and grow a big following. What attracts most to Yu-Gi-Oh! is a mixture of its distinct designs and its incredibly dark stories, as the shows are famous for eventually having very serious tones and dark personal risks for the characters. With grim Egyptian themes, the shows go from friendly card games to games that will decide the fate of the world. Some villains were only cartoonishly evil, making the show entertaining but many kidnap friends and family to force people into dueling them. Reminder, this is all a massive advertisement for a literal children's card game. Although, the franchise hasn't really been targeted for kids in a long while. While the kids who first got into the franchise in 2000 had grown, so had the franchise. Each show would add new card mechanics as well as increasing the card pool. This and implementing the top deck combo god appeal of the shows into the actual card game made it too complicated over time. I mean, Yu-Gi-Oh cards are infamous for having way too much text to describe how they work, despite all being very recognizable and simplified from the shows. To this day, I still don't even know how Synchro summons and Pendulum, whatever the fuck works. And the character designs also decided to become more complex in its need to stay cool and edgy. Eventually, Yu-Gi-Oh! became something you had to already be into, as it was too intimidating for outsiders. Sure, new kids might have still watched the shows and tried the games, but after 20 years, the show's concepts and card game mechanics had gone way over board. So Konami was struggling to gain new fans of the series for a very long time, and they were trying to figure out a solution to this problem. Enter Yu-Gi-Oh! Sevens, the seventh iteration of the show and a fresh start for a whole new generation. Sevens features more generic and cheaper character designs that give the entire show a different vibe from its previous art styles. This was the result of changing studios, cutting animation costs, the traditional Yu-Gi-Oh! style being insanely difficult to replicate, and, most of all, appealing to their target audience of the upcoming generation. In fact, in fact, all aspects of this show are done with that last point in mind. Yuga is 11, the youngest protagonist in the franchise, the main cast are all in the fifth grade, the tones are much more lighthearted, and even the voice actors are all actual 15-year-old kids. The new game mechanic that Sevens brings is actually an entirely new format called Rush Duels. Rush Duels is aimed to make matches more quicker and more exciting. There's only three card slots of each type for the new board, normal summons per turn are now unlimited, and card effects are restricted to once a turn stopping crazy chain combos, and you always draw up to five cards during the draw phase, which promotes using everything you've got to make use of the hand refresh. For those that play the physical card game, to play Rush Duels, you also need to use cards specifically marked for Rush Duels, as many cards adapted from the main game have likely been altered to balance the format. The plan with Rush Duels is fairly obvious, especially with Konami's growing reach in the mobile marketplace. Bring in a new audience of kids into a fresh start of the series with a simplified format that can easily be made into a mobile game. Naturally, some see Seven's direction, and especially the character designs, as a sin to the franchise. I see it as a way to take a step back and try something new. There's a lot of potential for Seven, since they aren't limiting themselves to selling Yu-Gi-Oh! to existing hardcore fans. While I'm sad to see the old art style go, as I grew up with it and worship characters like Seto Kaiba, I'm very interested in seeing where the series goes from here. I'm not saying the series will definitely be great, just that they have room to try new things. I might like those things, Things, and so might you. The first episode of Sevens has aired already, and it is fan-subbed, but you likely won't find the show licensed for a while. Crunchyroll used to license and simulcast the previous Yu-Gi-Oh! iterations, but Sevens is either delayed or might go somewhere else entirely. Though Crunchyroll is hosting the new Shadowverse anime this season, which is another popular card game, and I wonder if that's factoring into why Sevens isn't there. Maybe this also has to do with the coronavirus situation, and they want to delay the show until car production and shipments can safely resume? 
room. I'm not sure what's going on with that, but I was still able to watch and find it. So now I'm going to break down the entirety of the first episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! Sevens. So buckle up, boys. It starts with a flash forward, in which we see our 11-year-old fiery-haired protagonist, Yuga Odo, piloting a dueling mecha with crowds of people riding his legs to cheer him on. We see the mecha sprint through the cityscape and run towards a spire, wherein the mystery protagonist awaits. The narrator tells us that this is the story of how Yuga will bring freedom to this world. Only before he can confront the villain, Yuga wakes up and realizes it was just a dream. Then we cue the show's opening with colorful slice-of-life sequences that mix with its new casino vibe song. By the way, the song for Sevens is named Na 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 Na, which is funny because it's Na seven times and because the number seven in Japanese is Na Na. This is, of course, the first of many times the number seven is going to show up. The pilot opens with Yuga hacking into his dual disc. Meanwhile, a nearby floating robot loudly declares that it's detected the hacking and gives Yuga a six minute and 66 second warning to stop or he will be penalized. I'm not sure why they decided on that time, nor do I know why they don't just call it seven minutes and six seconds, since that's what the time actually amounts to. It's probably some on the nose symbolism that the people running this dual network now are evil, as 666 is typically used to refer to the devil. This trend of sixes being associated with this corporation continues when Yuga fails to finish his hacking and receives a penalty, his fifth penalty actually, and if he receives a sixth one, his account will be banned. Then we cut to the next morning where Yuga yawns as cheerful music plays and he rides his bike to Goha 7th Elementary School. Another floating robot in the area smiles and greets the students before detecting Yuga's bike and lecturing him that it seems to be modified. As you can tell by now, these robots are strict despite their friendly voice and expressions. These two altercations with robots goes into the show's main theme of breaking away from traditional rules to try something different. As other students discover Yuga now has five penalties as it's always visible on your dual disc, we meet another member of the main cast, Gakuto Sogetsu, the student council president. Gakuto is a purple-haired strict by-the-book guy that wears formal school uniform attire and continuously lectures Yuga for his constant disregard of the rules. First, he questions the bike, and Yuga explains that it's his dual bicycle, which made me immediately have war flashbacks to Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds. God, no, please, not again. Then we get a quick side view of Roman Kirishima, a magenta-haired guitarist who's a member of the school band. We don't get to know her too much from this episode, but we can tell from the opening and her gimmick that her deck is musically themed. From what we find out later, Roman claims she isn't interested in dueling and really only cares about her guitar. But there is a shot in the opening of her crying in the dark, so don't think she'll just be a cheerleader without a story. Gakuto continues lecturing Yuga, screaming when he hears Yuga is trying to hack his dual disc, and then formally explains to the viewers about the dual network and the penalty system. In the lecture, he also explains that the dual discs are completely controlled by the Goha Corporation, so attempting to modify them and accumulating six penalties will result in a system-wide ban. Yuga explains that he was just trying to install new rules into his dual disc. He proudly shouts his catchphrase, My Road, proclaiming that he wants to play the game his own way, which is entirely what this show is about, telling the viewers that they should have fun and live their life in whatever way makes them the happiest. Yuga's goal is to install his rush dual rules onto his dual disc to show the world that it's become too dry and strict, and that it can be more fun and out there. The conversation gets shut down when the school bell rings and another robot flies in, automatically locks everyone's dual discs, and begins to teach the class. Here we also see a quick glimpse of the blue-haired last of the main cast, Tatsuhisa Kamijo. He's clearly the dragon deck in the group, as apparent by his bad boy appearance, his blue eyes white dragon colored hair, though he spies on our protagonist from a distance, and the fact that we clearly see him and a new blue dragon card in the opening. Alright fine, only the last part really makes it clear. Then we cut to the end of the school day, where we see two students attempting to trade cards with each other before another robot comes out and lectures them, saying trading cards personally through individuals is prohibited, and that they need to trade under the supervision of the Goha Corporation. If you haven't guessed by now, the world they inhabit is run by a massive corporate conglomerate, they control the robots that monitor the cities and penalize people, they own and run the schools where they likely indoctrinate the kids for future control by the corporation, hell, why stop there? They own the company Metropolis that the citizens live in. Yeah, their city is called Goha City, and they run everything from daily necessities to shelter. And of course, they also control the dueling network, which looks like it was once integral to the unifying connection of the world, but now it's being heavily used by Goha to maintain their power. I emphasize all of this because many Yu-Gi-Oh fans were worried about Sevens early on when they saw the preview of the opening. These concerns 
concerns were mostly from a design perspective, but they also had problems with it tonally, as Seven seems much more lighthearted than Yu-Gi-Oh has ever been. While it might seem like it at a glance, and the first episode isn't very cynical of its own world, it's clearly laying out the groundwork for a more serious story. The way that the show subtly tells you that Goha controls everything and is the villain of this show without ever showing any comically evil antagonist or saying that Goha needs to be stopped is really interesting to me. Continuing, after Yuga bikes past the students from the last scene, we transition into his first interaction with Tatsuhisa, who proclaims himself as the school's number one duelist, and tells Yuga that he can call him Rook, likely a reference to his name's kanji meaning castle. Rook has usually been localized in English online as Luke, so that's what I'll call him too. Anyways, he stops Yuga and asks if they can talk, but when Yuga tries to drive past him, Luke touches his bike and sparks come from his hands and make his bike stop. This reveals that he can somehow send a small electric shock from his hands to short out technology. Luke tells Yuga that he believes his new rules for the game are likely the path to unlocking a mystery he's been trying to solve. The mystery being an ancient prophecy which will reveal the world's king of games, a common event in Yu-Gi-Oh shows. So a curious Yuga follows him to an underground place as Luke explains that a Goha engineer at one point secretly installed a back door in the duel system, and whoever could unlock this door would become the king of duels. When they arrive, a hologram appears and states that he will test if a challenger is worthy of being the king of duels. Luke had discovered the program a week ago and had been trying to solve the puzzle, but he discovered that even if you duel it and win, that wasn't the correct answer. And whether you win or lose, you receive a penalty on your duel disc. In fact, Luke reveals he's already banned from dueling as a result. But when he heard Yuga talk about his rush duel system, he theorized that Yuga's road could be the key to solving the puzzle, meaning that the answer isn't just to play the game, but to play it in your own way. So they decide to have Yuga risk his final penalty on this dueling puzzle by first attempting to hack into his duel disc. As he's working on that, Gakuto nearby notices Yuga's bike and comes in to yell at him for not coming to the student council office after school. Of course, he freaks out when he sees the hologram and finds Yuga attempting to hack his duel disc again. Then a nearby robot flies in, crying about the hacking attempt and starts a timer, threatening to penalize everybody present. Through all of this, Luke calls out Roman, who was also hiding in the room. She comes out and suspiciously says that she was just practicing guitar on the top floor. Then, to delay the robot, Luke uses his electricity to short out the robot and stop the timer. Quickly after, a loud chime marks the completion of Yuga's hacking, and the hologram's floor raises to reveal an ancient door, as the hologram declares that his rifle challenger is finally here. The cast cheers until Luke reminds them that the installation isn't complete yet, as Yuga only hacked into it but hasn't set it up for rush duels yet. That's when they also notice his dual disc battery is dying. Fearing a potential penalty as if it were his own life on the line, Gakuto runs outside to grab Yuga's bike and begins using it to generate electricity for the dual disc. This works, but at around the same time, the warning robot comes back to life, and Luke now finds out that his power to shock only works twice a day, a power which has only been briefly explained by Luke as some kind of demon living inside him. When they realize they don't have time to manually install the rules for rush duels first, Yuka decides to use what's called, and I kid you not, real-time duel programming, with which he can, as the name implies, program the rules of their duel in real time as he plays. Yeah, you remember all the parts with the original show just constantly ignoring the rules to make the duels more interesting? To the point where Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged used Kaiba to coin the phrase, screw the rules, I have money? Sevens has literally made it so that they can do whatever they want with their games if they want to. Which works well with the show's themes, but it's just funny to think that screw the rules is now a canon mindset in the anime. In fact, real-time dual programming is immediately confirmed to be how the developers of the game apply updates. This doesn't make sense at all, and definitely wouldn't be the smartest method. Sure, it helps with testing the game and making adjustments on the fly, but you'd still have to run tests for every other element of the game to make sure the rules you just arbitrarily implemented are properly balanced. We're not even talking about bug fixes or quick tweaks to a platformer. We're talking about literal balance patches for an entire trading card game. Like, game adjustments usually aren't just made and then immediately sent out into the world. Even if they're automatically tested for bugs, you'd still want it all playtested by actual QA people to make sure you didn't accidentally break the game with a new combo. And if we assume Goha's tech is so advanced that they can instantly run simulations for the entire game to prove it's balanced, it would still need to essentially solve the game and make heavy automatic balance changes to adjust, and then also test the entire game after that. Eventually, all the automatic balancing and changes would make the game boring. I know I'm thinking about it way too much for a kid's show 
show targeted to promote a children's card game, but as a computer science major, my brain broke at that scene. Anyways, with the main cast all here, the risks of penalty at stake, and the revealed ancient door, the stage is set for the first duel in Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s and the introduction of Rush Duels. The match starts with Yuga's dual disc transforming from a five card slot into a shorter three card slot, the new shape of course looking like a large number seven attached to his arm. They each start with four cards in their hand and Yuga draws as he goes first. He then immediately throws down three monsters from his hand. I know I already explained the rules of Rush Duels earlier and talked about the point of the show being to ignore the rules and just have fun in your own way, but when I saw that moment, I burst out laughing. Because of all the ways to say screw the rules, I think filling your entire side of the board with monsters on the first turn with no gimmick or combos is just the perfect way to do it. It literally feels like that one kid in the neighborhood who used to have lightsaber fights with you growing up, and you would clearly beat them, but he just keeps going, nah, -uh, you didn't hit me, nah, -uh. and eventually you stop talking to him because you realize how annoying he was. That kid probably works at the grocery stores now. Anyways, Yuka can't attack on the first turn, so he sets his last two cards face down, which empties his hand and ends his turn. When the hologram accepts this new programming, it realizes it can now normal summon two monsters and then use them to tribute summon the iconic blue eyes white dragon on his first turn. Because of course you were going to see a blue eyes white dragon, and of course it was coming out on the first turn. Why wouldn't it? He then uses a spell card that destroys all of Yuga's monsters and then has his blue eyes attack Yuga directly. Are you worried Yuga lost already because Rush Duel probably also means less life points? Well, worry not because yes, Rush Duel does use less life points, but of course it uses 4,000 life points. Yuga is now only 1,000 shy of being beaten. Our hero still has a very slim chance of winning this. As Yuga dramatically lays on the ground after the holographic attack from the blue eyes white dragon, a concerned Gakuto runs up and realizes that Yuga has no cards in his hand. He comically cries as he believes there's no way Yuga can win now, and he knows he'll receive a penalty. But Yuga just confidently sits up and smiles as he reminds everyone of the fun of rush duels. After he leaps up, he starts his turn by immediately drawing five cards. Now I'm not saying this is totally the problem with real-time dual programming since you can just change the rules if things aren't going your way. I'm just saying to keep in mind the lightsaber kid you grew up with and tell me you don't see it. After checking the timer to remind the viewer that it's only been four minutes, Yuga summons two monsters and then uses a monster effect to top deck and tribute summon his ace monster, the Seven Roads Magician, which I'm not a huge fan of, at least in its CGI form. Then he uses a combination of spells to selectively discard cards and power up Seven's Road. It's already more powerful than Blue Eyes, but Yuga isn't done yet. He then reveals that Seven's Road's effect makes his attack grow with each different attribute monster in his graveyard. Seven's Road will be at 6,700 attack, and since this effect is activated by discarding the top card in his deck, all he needs is the top deck, the missing attribute. And of course he does, bringing Seven's Road Magician's attack up to, you guessed it, 7,000 points, beating the Blue Eyes White Dragon and directly hitting the hologram for exactly all of his 4,000 life points. The game is over in two whole turns and in less than six minutes and 66 seconds, as is natural with Rush Duels. With the hologram defeated, a message appears telling the gang that the rules of Rush Duels has been successfully installed. The ancient door appears again and opens, shining a beam of light onto Yuga, the next prophesized king of duels, followed swiftly by all of Yuga and Luke's penalties being cleared. And then to end the show, everyone's dual disc is turned into a seven. Yep, that's right, everyone has to play Rush Duels now, not just Yuga and the gang, but the entire world. Remember the point of the show originally being everyone should play how they want? I guess not. I guess I'll just die. All that matters is everyone playing Rush Duels, and I'm sure that'll be refreshing for a world that's been stuck with the same game for years, but I mean, there's definitely people who liked how dueling was before, like Gakuto, someone extremely rule-oriented who is likely a firm believer that the game was designed the original way for a clear reason. I don't know, maybe Konami does have nefarious plans with Seven. The casino-esque opening song and slot machine like Seven Shape of the Dual Disc might be some kind of subtle way to get kids into gambling. I mean, both the trading cards and mobile games are centered around gambling just to build your collection. And of course, Konami is already huge in the slot machine and gacha game industry, but I'd like to think, even if Konami is doing this, at least the animation studio seems to be trying its best to make it entertaining and build its world and story with passion. In fact, while watching this, I almost wondered if the Goha Corporation is actually supposed to be a symbolic message about Konami itself. It's no surprise that despite many popular franchises coming from Konami, there's a lot of skepticism and hatred online towards their business practices. Is the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! 
Robin's actually supposed to be a dystopian future in which Konami's influence has spread from games to total global control? That would be hilarious to me if it's true. Anyways, the first episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s turned out to be an incredibly interesting experience, and I can't wait to see what more comes from it. Despite my nitpicks and problems with the show, these hypothetical problems are usually what makes Yu-Gi-Oh! just a fun time all around to watch. Will 7s grow into a story that proves Yu-Gi-Oh! can look and feel different while still intriguing both new and existing fans of the franchise? That remains to be seen. But I know I'm enjoying it so far, and I hope you'll give it a try too. And that wraps up this video. If you liked it, I mean, you know the drill. Like, comment, subscribe, Twitter, Twitch, all that. Patreon, dollar and Patreon, you can get early access to these scripts, and you can see my other mad ravings of some stuff that I may or may not make into videos like this. Here's a little fun Easter egg about this video. When I was towards the end of writing this, the script was actually seven pages long. Am I saying Illuminati confirmed? I wouldn't dare. But, but I did try to, you know, make sure it stayed at seven pages. I, I'm just saying. <laughs>